Uh, and it is 9.40 p.m. Is that right? Ooh. No, yeah. it's 1.40 for us. So it's probably time to get started. Uh, and obviously, Michael, you can hear me, yes? Yes, yes I can hear you. Yes, hear and, you. and you can see me as well? I can see you've got two hands. Cool, but you can't see the audience, right? There is no one there as far as I'm concerned. You're just faking okay. the whole thing. <laughs> okay, so the only feedback you're going to get is sound from the audience, right? So let's only do... Really loud. Yeah, let's do a bit of a sound check um, just to make sure Mike can get some feedback. So let's make some noise. Big round of applause. I think, I think you must have the... Um, the uh, noise suppression on, so as soon as it got loud, it was quiet. <laughs> brilliant, well done, brilliant. But you could hear that, right? I can hear that. Okay, cool. And if something really funny happens, can we get like a laugh? Like, as loud as you can. Go! <laughs> Did you get that? Yeah, I got that. Okay, got cool, that. cool, cool, cool. So uh, we were both, both meant to be here in real life, but you know, some last minute changes meant unfortunately Michael couldn't make the trip. So we decided to chuck his big old head up on the screen there. And actually, if I come stand next to him, this is kind of proportionate to what it'd be like in real life. So <laughs> there's not too much of a difference. Um, but I think we're good to go. So let's cross our fingers that uh, the internet holds out. So Michael, what are we doing here? Well, um, you know what? I think I've just worked it out. What have you worked out? The ultimate architecture for all apps. I've worked out how to write all code going forwards. Right. And um, how are you going to measure that? Oh, do you know, maybe we could write a voting app where everyone will have the opportunity to share their view on all the important debates in programming and computer architecture. It's going to be awesome. Oh, an app. You know what? That's a great idea. Yeah, so what I'm thinking is that we build an app, which is like a catalogue of all the coding debates. Each of these topics typically has, you know, two sides, like, I don't know, SQL versus no SQL, and people can vote for their preference using their mobile phone. The results are collated on every topic, and finally the results get displayed. And do you know, I guess it'll probably just be a big old monolith. Nah. I'm pretty sure we're going to need microservices, the votes. They will need to go into an event stream fed to the vote processor service, which will feed to an aggregator service prior to being displayed on the results service. Ooh, ooh. We'll probably need a user registration service too. Well, maybe. Well, but I mean, we're both Ruby developers, so I guess we could build it with Ruby. I think I just lost some street cred there. <laughs> No, no, I think Rust. Rust is way more appropriate for this project. But you know what? Maybe we start out with a prototype in Ruby. Anyway, let's get started. Hey, huh, just saw this last commit. And what is that wall of weird characters? Tabs? Hang on a second. Are you suggesting we use tabs for indentation? Let's just recap what tabs and spaces are. Well, the concept of the tab originated as a way to make entering rows of columns and uh, rows and columns of data easier on typewriters. Nowadays, tabs can be adjusted to various widths, depending, uh, typically ranging from the width of a single character to the span of eight characters. Users or systems can decide how wide they want tabs to be. And in programming, tabs are also uh, utilized to neatly structure code and enhance its readability. The space is the white space character you get when you press the space bar on a keyboard. We use white space to separate our words in English. In programming, we also use space to separate programming terms and tokens. Most programming languages also use a number of spaces to indent the code. For Ruby, it's two spaces. For HTML, it's often four space characters. All editors are equipped to enter the preferred number of space characters when the tab key is pressed on the keyboard. Round one, developer versus developer, SmackDown, tabs versus spaces. Tell me more about tabs. All right, let's talk about tabs, folks. So tabs bring consistency, right? By always having the same width for indentation. It's like the tab's main job is setting the right spacing for our code, and we all know how important single responsibility principle is. And guess what? 
users can adjust tab width to fit their liking, which means they can customize how the code looks. Just imagine coding on a small laptop, make the tab two characters wide, cram more code on the screen. Big Office screen day, bump it up to eight characters for comfy reading. Tabs, keeping code cozy for all occasions. Hold on a second. Let's get this straight. Spaces mean consistency. Tabs, on the other hand, can switch things up with different widths for tab. Your first tab could be two characters, your next four, and the third eight. Talk about a wild ride. Now, here's where spaces shine. They're straightforward. One character is just that, one character, all nice and even. We want coding to be easy, inviting even for beginners. Think about it. When things are simple and familiar, we're easy, they're easier to grasp. That's a big plus for those new to the field or changing career. Why complicate life with invisible characters that come in all shapes and sizes, causing chaos for the unsuspecting? Let's keep it simple, shall we? Spaces, my friend, you seem to have a thing for them. But hey, why not go all out? Why not just use, say, six or eight spaces by default? I mean, tools can help, but trust me, you'll be wearing out that back backspace key like there's no tomorrow. Maybe even break it in the process. Those keys do have their limits, you know. Tabs, on the other hand, bring consistency. That's a win for accessibility. Think about your team. Any visually impaired coders in the mix? You're wearing glasses. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're all about welcoming them on board. Still wearing those glasses, I see. For some people, a tab size of one character in a big font can be a real game changer. Other times, those eight character tabs do the trick. No argument can hold up against making things accessible for our fellow coders. And guess what? You can even switch things up on the go, like using the tab stop query parameter in GitHub. Keyboard durability, my friend. <laughs> That's a new one. Are you really going through keys like it's a sport? And hey, are you even the co in the coding game these days? Are you still using tab at all? Look, modern projects are all about formatters. So, you write in your own style and the formatter does the rest, making everything look the same across the code. Imagine this, tabs and spaces might look the same on the surface, but they're like secret agents, invisible but influential. Mixing them just adds confusion. Let's simplify things for our everyday coding. Spaces are your buddies for precise alignment, which makes your code easier on the eyes. Plus, They've got a popularity factor going for them, except for some outliers like Go and C. Most languages and their GitHub code, uh, um, sorry, most languages as seen on GitHub prefer spaces. So there's that. Well, just following the crowd isn't it? <laughs> just following the crowd isn't a good enough reason. Spaces are too strict. They won't let developers adjust for readability and they hog memory. Truth be told, I do have a slight preference for tabs. But that's only because I'm anal and I prefer precision. Oh, and did, was that a good one? Can you laugh a bit louder? No. <laughs> oh, you know, and, and don't ask, overlook size. Tabs use fewer characters, meaning smaller code and less bandwidth needed. End of story. Developers at Copenhagen, they care about performance, you know. If you're into tools like Make, which you totally should be, tabs are the way to go. Plus, Go and a chunk of C code are tab fans too. Even Ruby, your favorite language, has tabs in its core. So it's not just me, it's Code Party. All right, check it out. Spaces are easy peasy. They work smoothly across various languages, systems, and editors. They're already fans, we're already fans of using spaces to split up keywords and tokens in our code. And even if you're a tab lover, spaces are still in demand. Let's stick with just one sneaky character for all your needs. And hey, ever heard of YAML? Yep, it's all about spaces. Plus, there's a bonus. Developers who use spaces make more money than those who use tabs. As data scientist David Robinson found out in his Stack Overflow 2017 developer survey. So, go with the space flow and maybe your wallet will thank you later. Well, you know, it's probably time to wrap this one up. Um, and see what you've all voted for. Except we didn't actually ask you to vote because we didn't even start the SmackDown. Uh, but up here, uh, if you scan that QR code and hopefully, uh, there we go. Oh, you've got it under control. Oh, it's so tight. Uh, could have done a better job. 
There, there's no way of stopping this voting, is there? Uh, no. What? what? Oh. <laughs> I didn't expect it. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. I, I think we're getting a lot Are of. You ready experience. to call it? Okay. We're going to call it. We're going to call it tabs. Oh, yes. Blue for the win. Woo! <laughs> Did we put a stop on this? No. <laughs> no. Okay. No, it's it's all free right. for all. No, no. Now we already started voting on the next one. <laughs> okay, well, you know, you can vote while we're talking, but uh, we're going to start on the next one. So, Michael, are we going to pair or solo on this this new app that we got under underway? Hang, hang on a second. What do you mean pair or solo? We'll just split up the working cards and work on it. Sure, but then we could still choose to pair. Pair programming is a development practice where two developers work together on the same code at the same time, usually one developer writing the code and the other one reviewing it in real time. Sounds expensive. Working solo is what most would consider normal, where a developer works alone or by themselves. It's not like they need anyone to hold their hand. Once the code is in a finalised state, it is peer reviewed by other developers on the team. We'd get twice as much work done soloing compared to pe this pairing idea. Round two, developer versus developer smackdown, pairing versus soloing. Michael, you could afford to do more pairing. Maybe then other developers would understand what your code even does. Pairing has a bunch of perks. It boosts code quality because two sets of eyes are on it, catching errors or bugs that one person might miss. According to Alistair Cockburn's 2000 paper, pair programming only takes 15% more time to solve a problem. But on the plus side, better design, fewer bugs, less risk, and it's more fun. That's statistically proven. You do enjoy pairing with me, don't you, Michael? No? Teaming up means more collaboration, which makes for a better work vibe and lifts morale. We share our skills and we learn from each other. Plus, fresh pairs can improve best practices and share ideas while working together or pair swapping. Wait a sec. Think about all those movies showing hackers, lone wolves in dark rooms, rocking headphones and hoodies, totally zoned in, developing software. It's all about getting in the zone too. Flying solo lets you concentrate. You can have music or quiet, no distractions from messaging, just you and the task. No boredom, no one pulling the project elsewhere. This also means more output since you set your pace without any chit chat with your pair. But hang on, the big debate around pair programming is whether the gains are worth it. Is it a win in the end to have two devs on a task that could easily be had by a solo programmer? Ah, uh, the flow zone, like Uncle Bob says. You'll type way more. You'll feel awesome, but the code might stink. Bob's tip, if you're in the zone, take a break. You know what I say? Skip that blind code spew zone. I don't know why you wrote that line. I don't get it. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> but team up, the point is team up instead, all right? Pair programming rocks for readable code. It stops knowledge from hiding in one person's head because both, own, both peers own the code and they know how it ticks. Pairing boosts talk time. That's right, better communication. Not something they're big on here in Denmark, but that's okay, that's okay. Uh, constant negotiation makes devs see all sides of the code, double, I double the ideas. Both folks stay in the loop, they tailor the chats to the pairs for best results. Lots of chatting means smoother work and less fuss coordinating changes. Pairing speeds up learning too. Imagine your project, this project, yeah, this amazing app, imagine it hits the stars and it grows and new folks join and, and we need to onboard and they catch on faster with code and, and business parts. And juniors love this too, pairing with pros and seeing different ways to fix stuff. Whoops. Gotcha. Pairing is awesome for learning and communication, but what about personality clashes? Some folks just don't jive with high energy pairing. Not everyone likes talking loud or sitting shoulder to shoulder all day. Skilled coders might prefer their own coding turf. Flying Solo has perks. It gives devs flexibility to work when and how they want. That's, that's great for independent workers who like their creative freedom. They dive deep into stuff that sparks their interest, exploring new ways to tackle things. It's smoother to work at your own pace, developing your style and testing new ideas. Oh, oh, 
let's talk money. Solo can be cheaper for the company than pairing up. Usually, you only need one dev for the job. Simple task, need fewer hands. No back and forth, decisions are quicker. And you don't need to keep a teammate up to date on every change, so you can tackle bigger parts all at once. Big steps on your own. Not my style. I prefer a small, agile mo moves. Always build, measure, learn. Speaking of small, check out feedback cycles, right? Sprints give you weekly feedback. Tests every five minutes, but pairing? It's like instant feedback. Seconds fast. Faster feedback means what? Less waste. And quicker feature development. You make better choices, you avoid wrong turns, and prevent over-engineering. Something we're all good at. Don't lie, I know. Uh, sometimes solo developers even forget what the problem was they were trying to solve in the first place. Right? <laughs> That's right. He can't hear you. He thinks I'm, he thinks I'm not funny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Working alone can lead to yeah, iffy code quality, right? No extra eyes, less collaboration. That's like a wall between you and the team. I don't see you guys voting more on pairing. Come on, come on. Blue. When devs own the code together, they step up the, and solve issues. They, the added accountability of having a pair sit with you means you're less likely to have code which doesn't adhere to team standards and have developers who are considering multiple options. Developers who give up on improving their, solu their solution and code that just isn't adequately tested. Let's face it. Your, um, your take on accountability sounds to me like micromanagement. Pairing can mess with the flow, forcing programming sessions even when you're not feeling it. Some folks work better when inspiration hits in their own rhythm. And guess what? Pair programming isn't meant for always. Going solo has its perks. No clashes or drama, just managing your own show. You need to master problem solving and learn the ropes yourself. Being on your own helps you gain confidence, fight imposter syndrome, and prove you are fantastic at creating top of software. So there's value in flying solo too. All right, well, let's see what the audience thinks. You know the drill, folks. If you haven't voted already, now is the time. We want to see some animation here, or do we want a grand reveal? All right, let's get some animation. Don't be a sheep, though. <gasps> what? Really? Come on. This is not looking good for me. <laughs> Okay, all right, fine. I think uh, I think soloing takes the cake here. I guess we should really make a start on this thing, though. You know, what editor should we use, Michael? Editor? What kind of question is that? We're obviously going to use them. <laughs> um. How is that obvious? Well, it's not like we're going to use Emacs or something. So now you have an issue with Emacs as well? Yeah, I have an issue with Emacs. The issue is, it was only an issue back in the 70s. Why is it even a thing these days? Well, Emacs, which is a really flexible text editor, actually goes way back to the 1970s, just like VI does. Emacs was initially developed by Richard Stallman as a set of editing macros for the Tico editor. And over time, it evolved into a fully fledged extensible editor written in Lisp. It's Emacs Lisp that allows for powerful customizations and has extensive set of packages. VI, or Visual Editor, has been extended to be Vim, or VI Improved. Vim is a super fast and productive editor that has gained a large and dedicated user community, becoming one of the most influentially influential and widely used text editors across various platforms and programming languages. Vim Motion, a fundamental game changer in editing, so much so that even Emacs uses Vim bindings in their evil mode. Round three, developer versus developer Smackdown Emacs versus Vim. Not sure you would even know how to exit a Vim session, so why don't you tell us more about email? <laughs> Let's face it, Michael, nobody would have guessed capital ZZ. The fact that the most read Stack Overflow page is not about how to e exit Emacs means Emacs should win by default. Yeah? Speaking of by default, most systems, like the Macs that we all use, every, all, all the .NET developers here, they all use Macs. Um, <laughs> 
We have Emacs turned on by default. Just type set minus O and you'll see Emacs is on by default. That's why in the terminal, heading control A takes you to the start of the line, control E to the end of the line. It works in Google Slides, Word Docs, VS Code, and all these other tools too. And guess what? All those em Emacs shortcuts like control R to reverse search, they work everywhere. Your terminal, your text editor, your IDE, some browsers, the list just goes on. Emacs isn't just for editing text though. It's like a hub for different tools, like code editing, making docs, managing emails, and so much more. And with its bunch of modes and packages, Emacs can become whatever you need. Uh, plus, <clears throat> it's known for being super customizable. You can build complex stuff, make your own functions, and create your own features. Emacs is like the superhero of editing. Why does Control A take you to the start of the line? Is it because A is the first letter of the alphabet? And why isn't Control Z the end of the line? Oh, because in most terminal apps, Unix that is, that would put the app in background. Moving around is like a workout. Control P for the line above. In Vim, everything's on the home row, right under your right hand. JJ for up and down and HL for left and right. That's efficiency, right? Vim even stands for VI improved, and lots of commands are shortened just like that. So you have U for up and back and D for down. Efficiency all the way. And here's the magic. These are one key commands. No crazy control alt or meta keys. Vim uses mode, like an insert mode for typing and a command mode for commands. And there's even a visual mode for jumping around and highlighting things. And if there's one reason everyone should use Vim, Vim it's Vim Motions. This mode system is why Vim's so powerful with simple key presses. Just like Emacs, you can customize Vim, especially with cool versions like NeoVim using Lua. And the best part, it's super far. Uh, you're pointing out how Vim's commands seem logical, right? But everyone agrees that Vim's learning curve is steep. Just look at this graph. See, it's all or nothing. And then there's Emacs, that's cool spiral. You know why? Because Emacs is not just an editor, it's like a whole operating system. It's got programming, uh, it's got this programming language called Elisp, which is like magic. Elisp lets you customize and expand Emacs in mind blowing ways. Yeah, Emacs might be a bit slower, it could take two seconds to open up on an older system. But here's the thing why would you even close it? You can run a shell inside Emacs. Like, it's like software inception. Feeling dizzy yet? That's why there's a spiral there. <laughs> With these shells in Emacs, you can practically live in it 24 7. Listen to music, jot down notes, and even play games. It's your all in one hub. Thanks for helping me prove my point. We're not here to make to-do lists, listen to music, or play games. We're here to code and zip around with Vim Motion key bindings. Whether you're using less to check out a Git log or any console with Unix read line, like a database console, you can zoom around with the same Vim motions. Even new tools like Canines, which handles Kubernetes clusters, uses Vim style shortcuts. Master those Vim motion keys and you'll reap the rewards in loads of places. And guess what? Even your beloved Emacs, as I mentioned before, has evil mode that uses Vim bindings. Because let's face it, Vim shortcuts are just a better way to edit files. Vim strikes the perfect balance. It's fast, powerful, and adaptable without being a nuisance. To code effectively, there's a basic level of skill you need. And you know what? That skill should include using Vim for editing. Look, I said it before, I'll say it again. Vim can be really tough for beginners. The setup and the keyboard commands can be, they can feel overwhelming for newbies. The learning curve can be steep, demanding, and demanding time and effort to get good at it. But hey, you know, after at least two decades, I'm sure you've got some shortcuts down. <laughs> Remember, coding isn't just about writing code. Some of the best code you and I have ever seen have been written by coders who can barely type and don't have an opinion on an editor at all. Coding is, uh, is a big, immersive adventure. You need to access things like the code itself, library explanations, the grand plan for the product, guides on how stuff works, version control magic, and more. And this is where Emacs really shines. Maybe some of those votes could go to Emacs now, yeah? 
It's more than an editor. It's a one-stop one -stop shop for all these things. That's why Emacs wins in the productivity race. We're all into productivity, right? No? Okay. It's simpler to start with, and you can level up its power using tons of community plugins or by making your own. Sounds like a jack-of-all-trade, master of none. Imagine taking one thing and making it super awesome. So good, you don't even notice it. This is the key part of the connection between your brain and the computer through your fingers and the keyboard, using Dvorak, of course, right into the editor. It's not a tool to fiddle with and customize a lot. Instead, it's like a crucial link between your programmer brain and the computer, almost like a nervous system. And that's what Vim nails. Vim is part of your nervous system. Yeah, right. You know what? There really isn't that much difference between them at all. They're equally terrible. I don't even know why this is considered a debate topic. But it's up to you to decide. Vim or Emacs, pick your poison. Let's go. I can't believe you just said that to a room full of developers. Of course, Vim is going to be the winner as it is already. All right, all right. I'm not doing so well on this one. <laughs> okay. Whew. I think we've discussed some good ideas today, and there's probably enough that I can get started on a few things. But get started? But you're remote. Uh, I mean, sh sure, we might not pair all the time, but we should at least be in the same place when we're working on this. Selena. <laughs> Are you serious? Did you want to lose another debate topic? Did you forget about what happened in 2020? Remote working is the way now. Well, it was for a while, but a lot of places have conceded they've gone back to the office. Just look at Amazon last month. Anyone who didn't want to move and be within commute distance was voluntarily dismissed. Oh, and Zoom. They've just gone back to the office too. Isn't their whole product like a remote pair sharing tool? Anyway, maybe you've forgotten what real life was like. Let me, how did you get dark all of a sudden? The lights went out <laughs> and I don't know how to turn them on. It's okay, we can still see you. <laughs> well, anyway, let me remind, at least the alarm didn't go off. Um, well, anyway, let me remind you what real life is like. Being together in real life, IRL, 2023, when working is also known as uh, working in a physical or co-located workspace. It offers numerous benefits that contribute to effective communication, collaboration, and overall team dynamics. Remote working is a work arrangement where employees perform their job duties from a location outside the traditional office, often working from home or other remote locations using internet-based technologies to stay connected and productive. Round four, developer versus developer smackdown, real life versus remote. Let's take a look at why working IRL has been so popular for so long. Face-to-face -face chats are gold. You get crystal clear communication. There's no, can you hear me nonsense. Can you hear can me? You hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you know, those eyebrow raises and gestures give extra meaning to words, avoiding mix-ups. Being in the same room is like a creativity booster. You can chat, you can brainstorm, solve stuff in the moment, cooking up cool solutions. And guess what? It tightens the team bond. Trust grows, everyone gets each other better, and the team spirit just shines. Decisions? Bam, they happen faster. Quick talk means quick fixes, agile moves. We've been doing this for ages and for good reason. Embracing remote work is like adding extra toppings. You know how I love extra toppings. People say they're super productive at home. There's less noise, more focus. Companies love it too. They care about what you deliver, not when you clock in. And guess what? Your life's a better mix of work, family, beach, whatever. No more stressing over traffic jams either. Surely after traveling halfway around the world, you'd know what a stressor commuting can be. Remote work says bye-bye to all of that. Stress. You know what? There's no stress like being completely isolated in a remote environment and having no idea if anyone else is online or if they're just annoyed at you or if they're trying to avoid you or if they're frozen. Oh my God, Michael, are you frozen? 
Are you... <laughs> okay. <laughs> stop. Stop now. <laughs> okay, you can move now. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, great. There's no stress like a little more anxiety. Thanks, but no thanks. What I'd prefer is to work in person where you get a little more informal knowledge sharing. You can really build up a collective learning environment. Working in person means we, we take our tasks more seriously. Remember how we put this talk together, Michael? Yeah, that's right. Sitting side by side got us through. And hey, <clears throat> being together really boosts engagement and job satisfaction. More positive work environment can have a real significant impact on morale and job fulfillment. Looking for job happiness? Stuck in a cubicle won't do it. I'll take a beach view and type with my kids any day. By the way, did you know I have four kids? Yeah, that's right. Flexibility is what makes me feel satisfied. Remote work offers flexibility, giving people more control over their work schedules, enabling them, enabling them to balance professional and personal responsibilities effectively. And here's a bonus. Remote work means a bigger talent pool. That's right. All the way over here from Australia, I've been made available at your conference all the way over there in Copenhagen. You're welcome. And by the way, thanks for being so inclusive. Did you know remote work can be inclusive for individuals with disabilities or those who face mobility challenges, providing them with greater opportunities to participate in the workforce? Remote work for the win. Glasses isn't really a disability, Michael. I think you'll find all the way over here in Copenhagen, my new friends who I've made through real life connections and hot air balloon making. Woo! <laughs> They're going to be very happy at the end of this when I switch you off. <clears throat> I guess that's actually a, another benefit for remote, but you know, <laughs> smack down, yes. <laughs> Back to business. Real-time talks and team working make solving problems a breeze. Better results, more team power. And then when, we, when our app really takes off and we need to hire new talent, in-person onboarding can make training sessions more engaging and effective, allowing new employees to build relationships, ask questions, and receive immediate feedback. I'm not, still not sold on this idea that in-person work um, has unique benefits. Remote work has a bunch of cool extras too, and I haven't even mentioned them all. We're talking about things like the environment. Remote work help cuts down, cut down carbon emissions by reducing commuting and office energy use, plus diversity in the, work, in the workforce. Companies that embrace remote work attract a wider range of candidates who need or want flexible options. Oh, and health perks. Remote work mean less exposure to germs keeping folks healthier and stopping the spread of sickness. You've made your point, but is it going to hold up with the astute developers in Copenhagen? Scan the QR code Scan. if you haven't already, get your votes in. <laughs> what? Scan the code, get your votes in. Let's see what's the better choice. <laughs> oh, sorry, real. I took his line. <laughs> Okay, okay, all right, cool. And the winner is, do you know, I'm really excited about this one. Do you know why? Oh, they hate you, Michael. <laughs> well, I hated you for all the other ones, so. <laughs> okay, but now you're looking the wrong way as well. Oh, what, down here? No? Yeah, that's Have right. You moved? Oh, hi. So what about the stats collector, huh? Um, well, yeah, I'm thinking stats collector will need to be very performant. And you know what? We may need to split that out into a separate service. Wait, hold on, a separate service already? Yeah, I mean, this has to be able to scale from the beginning. You don't want the performance of the stats collector impacting our presentation of the results. You know, if one of those clients goes rogue. Uh, I think we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Maybe we should recap what it means to have one app versus many services. Meet the monolith. It's like having one superstar app. 
that's your go-to for everything, your fancy interface, the smarts behind the scenes, and how you get your data. This setup's been around forever, and it's all about having one powerhouse that does it all. Super easy, super reliable, and it works like a charm. Picture this, one app, one database, handling everything, everything from the cool stuff you see to behind the scenes magic, taking care of users, administration, and showing off all the facts and figures. Microservices. Imagine a group of buddies all working together like one smooth app from your point of view. This style's all about teamwork, like a crew of mini heroes doing their special thing, all chatting through APIs. It's like having a bunch of separate apps, each with its own storage, joining forces by APIs. Each app shines at one thing. When they team up, it's like having the whole show in one go. Flexibility, scalability, speedy development are the perks here. Round five, developer versus developer, SmackDown, Monolith versus microservices. All right, tell me why these monoliths are so great then. All right, let's kick off. You know what? Monoliths, they're the easy road. Simpler to handle, develop and manage all in one tidy code bundle. They're like reliable workhorses, perfect for smaller projects or when you're after straightforward reliability. On the flip side, we've got microservices. They're kind of like chatty teammates teaming up for greatness, but bringing all that extra complexity. Building and managing them, it's like conducting a lively orchestra. If you listen to Nicholas Gustafsson talking about fleet management on Monday, you know what I'm talking about. Now for our app, what we're aiming for is to get to the core business logic right. We want to present a topic, have users vote, tally those votes, and then reveal them. It's not that complicated. If we dive into full microservices from the start, we'll end up spending more time setting things up and making them compatible than actually writing the app. And security? You guys are big on security, right? No? Okay. <laughs> security! <laughs> Well, that's a whole other layer of concern. Imagine accidentally allowing a user to publish something directly to your stats display. Yikes. Sure thing. We do need to set up each service and figure out how they're interconnected, which sounds like work, but as our project grows, so does the monolith's complexity. Imagine the app. It's like a puzzle or a game. And with a monolith, it only gets bigger and bigger. Now picture this. Getting stats and showing them off are like two different games. Mixing them up could turn our app into a jumble. That's the monolith. But if the games are two separate services, we can play each game separately. Getting stats or displaying stats. And they won't mess with each other. Plus, we can make them work harder by adding more teammates to a, a, teammates to a particular service. You and I are the VIPs for viewing stats. So one server is plenty. But lots of folks voting will need a bunch of collectors to handle that crowd. Horizontally scaling individual services is how microservices can help us scale. Yeah, I get you. <clears throat> I get you. People can write messy code in any setup, even in microservices if they're not careful. Making them into these tangled distributed messes and fixing that mess in microservices? That's way harder than in a monolith. Monoliths have a clear view of tangled code and, and, and they need less gear. But let's get real here. Why do we need three services and three databases just to find out if tabs are better than spaces? Now, think about this. If we want to make, uh, if we want to make, if we, <laughs> if we want to make vote changes, like letting users take back a vote, did you work out you can do that? So, you know, you can, you can switch to the blue side if you want. <laughs> It's, it's like changing a bunch of gears. We'd have to tweak the front, update voting, tweak aggregation, and update stats. Orchestrating and deploying each microservice with compatibility for any other microservice already deployed. And with a monolith, you know what? It's like fixing a puzzle all at, one, all at once. Easy peasy, quick changes, one place, and one update for all. It's simpler, snappier, and we're good to go. Speedy, but with a catch. Imagine if the main hub goes down. Oof! The whole system's toast. And let's say a wild user goes nuts on our stats, like some have. Too many connections. Boom! We're effectively DDoSed. And the stats don't show up. Nobody wants a single weak link. But check this out. With our resilient microservices, if one part stumbles, like our stats collector taking a nap, no biggie. The other stats still, the other stats still party on. One service fumbles, others keep grooving. 
monoliths can still be scaled, just like they have done for years. Toss in an API gateway and some caching if needed. Now let's talk about those multiple moving pieces. They can slow things down since they chat over the network, which means cumulative latency overhead. We've already got enough latency, Michael, in this remote presentation. Things take a little bit longer. Each piece talks to the next, building up time, and we want those stats lightning fast, right? Just like our snappy responses in this debate. No? Okay. <laughs> Testing yeah. Microsoft. <laughs> Testing microservices, it's a bit trickier. More pieces, more chats, but with monoliths, one big code family, it's easier to test. For small teams with not much to spare, a monolith is your champ, fewer pieces, less fuss. Okay, I see where you're coming from, but think about this. The monolith, you're kind of tied down in your tech choices. Got to keep everything compatible with that one big code family. And watch out for those dependency clashes. If different parts want different versions at the same time, chaos alert. Now, microservices, they're flexible, like tech community. That each can strut its stuff in a different tech or language and updates a breeze. You can tweak and easily deploy them one by one, which makes changes a piece of cake. Plus, they're simpler to understand. Think of it this way. You can rebuild each microservice in about two weeks. So understanding the whole code, totally doable. Unlike a monolith, which can grow so big that even the smartest brains can hardly grasp it at times. All right, well, the audience isn't very excited by this debate, but what do you think? Come on, monolith or microservices? If you haven't scanned the QR code, we could afford to have a few more votes on the blue side. Yeah, no, okay. Votes are good, votes are good. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are you ready? Oh, microservices, really? Okay, okay. I know, it's not going well for me. <laughs> you know what? Here's one I can win. It looks like we're going to need users to create votes and register, and we're also going to need to fetch the stats, so we should be good with a users, votes, and stats endpoints, right? Endpoint? What do you mean? We can just fetch it all via query on the GraphQL single endpoint. GraphQL? We don't really have a huge graph of data here. Surely having a couple of dedicated endpoints will be enough. I mean, I'm not going all Hatios on you just yet. And you wanted this to be small and performant. I say we go with REST, but maybe we could compare the two and, and see if an obvious choice jumps out. REST stands for Representational State Transfer. Often REST is only implemented to perform simple CRUD actions uh, and uses the common HTTP verbs put, get, put, post, and delete. GraphQL is a data query and manipulation language for APIs developed by Facebook in 2012 and open sourced in 2015. As opposed to exposing many endpoints, GraphQL exposes a single endpoint and responds with precisely the data a client asked for, a GraphQL server can also fetch data from separate services and present the data in a unified graph. Round six, developer versus developer, SmackDown, REST versus GraphQL. REST is older, so how about I start? <clears throat> Way back in the days, before 2000, when I was still in diapers, there was no set way to design or use APIs. I, I don't know that for a fact, I'm just assuming, um, taking your word for it. <laughs> APIs used protocols like SOAP, and they were really complicated to make, understand, maintain, and fix when something went wrong. And then in 2000, a bunch of smart folks, smart folks led by Roy Fielding came up with REST architecture, and it totally changed the API game. REST is all about letting two servers anywhere in the world talk and share data as long as they're connected to the internet, especially when it comes to client server apps. It's made for big internet use and follows standards like HTTP, URI, JSON, and XML. The cool part is that REST makes the client and server work separately and uses text to send information. Plus, it's easy for developers to use REST services. 
Remember those early 2000s when we could finally see JSON coming, over, coming from a server and quickly mash up a couple of APIs? That was thanks to REST, making data fly around everywhere. Us developers realised that REST was a step up from the chaos before, but it's not that great of a, for a couple of reasons. First, there's no official guide on how to do a REST API. Yeah, we have HTTP verbs like post and put and response codes like 200 and 403. But if someone asks, what code should I use if a user can't answer oh. for not found or oh. a 403 Michael, unauthorized? Michael, Again, Michael. Makes a guess. Michael. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you just... Uh... You just, you know, you got the spinner of death and you kind of froze up there. But it's cool. We've got you back. All right. Where am I up to? Should we <laughs> take a revote on that real life versus remote? <laughs> <laughs> am I might just, I'll just go with this slide, okay? We good? We good? Yeah, we good. All right. Let's go again. Us developers realized that rest was a step up from the chaos before soap and all that. But it's not that great for a couple of reasons. First, there's no official guide on how to do a REST API. Yeah, we have HTTP verbs like POST and PUT and response codes like 200 and 403. But if someone asks, hmm, what code should I use if a user can't access something? Is it a 404 not found or a 403 unauthorized? The back end makes a guess and the front end makes guesses on the back end's guess and this guessing leads to, guess what, bugs. But look at GraphQL. It's got a formal specification at spec.graphql.org. This is where they explain the GraphQL language types and how to check responses, everything. It makes it way easier for new developers to hop into a GraphQL project and know what's available in the API, how to use it and what to expect back. REST leads to endless debates about whether something should be a put or a patch. Have you ever seen someone using a phone app and thinking, Hmm, I sent a message to my friend. Hmm, I wonder if that was a put or a patch. <laughs> Tip for you. They don't care. And with GraphQL, all those arguments go away. Not only that, but you also have a contractual agreement on what is returned and what type it is. It is in the query you send to the server. It will pass exactly the fields that you want returned. You know what, users of an app aren't thinking, did that button do a type check on what's coming back? They care if it can handle a lot of users. And guess what? REST can scale, just like the internet, by allowing some rules and being stateless and, and, and built-in scalability. REST brings performance, simplicity, and reliability. And it also makes things mo easily modifiable and portable and maintainable, thanks to the uniform way of dealing with resources. When you ask to create a vote, you might get a status 500 if the server's down, right? Or a 422 if your data's wrong or a 403 if you're not allowed. And the network along the way knows what's going on. So when you get the current stats, a status of 200 success and special headers that let the response be cached, saving server work and network traffic. But in GraphQL, guess what? Every response is a 200. 200, you're unauthorized. 200, your query is unvalid. 200. This is the millionth time I've responded with this, but you just can't cache the, the response for others to use because, well, GraphQL. So in the words of the line breakers last night, your API is a wall of shame. And you give rest a great name. <laughs> The rest builds on the scaling of the internet. Look, every choice has ups and downs. With GraphQL, you can make your app more efficient. Each user can ask for exactly the data they need, which stops wasting time and data, unlike in REST, where you might ask for one thing and then get led to another and then another. GraphQL has the flexibility to precisely choose the info you want all in one go. Unlike REST, where you have to plan out each data request, GraphQL lets you set it up and give control to the app. Also, GraphQL has a strongly typed schema, which can help caching er with catching errors and reducing miscommunications between teams. It is also good with complex queries that would be difficult, or maybe even impossible, with REST. And all this flexibility and consistency leads to a greater developer happiness. 
and more decoupled design between the back end data and the front end. But hold on, Michael. Our app is just about voting, gathering data and showing it. So what is this, you know, super complicated stuff that you're thinking of? Like what types of data do you need? And what exactly are all these super fancy queries you're dreaming of for the app? Let's keep it simple, shall we? All we need is a way to get a topic, put a vote and get stats. It's like a smooth flow, right? Oh, you know, and if we want to change things rather than GraphQL, we could use WebSockets. Who even needs an API? There's more than one way to write an app. I say, you all vote for me, vote blue, let's just be done with this. You know what, building apps in different ways might seem tempting, but it's not always the smartest move. Consistency pays off big time, and that's why I'm all for GraphQL, trust me. Picking the red side is choosing the right path, and that's 100% true fact. Plus, this voting app will be a breeze with a single GraphQL interface. We need, we only need to set it up once and then clients can ask if it whatever they need. The back end and the front end will be clearly separate. One of us can focus on storing the data while the other works on how it's used up front. It's like a winner that keeps both sides happy. All right, well, call me more of a full stack girl, but what do you all think? REST or GraphQL? If you haven't done it already, I know you know the drill. Scan. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Have I got this one in the bag? How, how are you doing the reveal? Uh, your face is over it and I'm just sliding you to the side. <laughs> yes! <laughs> ah, that's what we need. You can watch the stream later, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I've got an idea for a new feature we could add. It's on a branch and... A branch? Why is it on a, a branch? Sorry, I've, I've had feedback on my accent. You might not have understood. I said a branch. Yeah, A branch. Why is it on a branch? Because we're developers and we work on branches. What do you mean, why is it on a branch? Well, there's only two of us. I thought we'd just work on trunks since it's way more efficient and you know, that's how people do it these days. Do they though? How do you get your code reviewed? Which people exactly don't use branches? How would you even get your code written in the first place if it's not on a branch? With trunk-based development, we're all about those bite-sized code pieces, sending them into the trunk non-stop. Yep, that's why it's called continuous integration. It's continuous. It's not batched up into branches. And the payoff, slash the time between starting a change and getting it deployed. We're a minimizing branch time, aiming for more teamwork, constant integration, and early high fives. Feature branching is a popular move. We're talking separate branches, branches for specific jobs. Enhancements, new features, bug fixes, they all get their own branch to play in and not interfere with other work. Here's the deal. The main branch, think develop or integration, is our stable base. When a feature is done, verified and ready for release, it gets merged. So no half-finished work being deployed. Round seven, developer versus developer, Smackdown, trunk versus branches. You are so losing this one. <laughs> Really? Well, just before I get into it, we've got about six minutes left, so we might need to be like a tiny bit faster, but that's cool. <clears throat> I've got three words for you. Faster feedback loop. That's right. Changes hit trunk often, which means speedy deployment and quick feedback for devs catching issues early, less debugging time, and say goodbye to huge co code conflicts. Now, for this pro for this project, uh, pushing to trunk is the only way. You code, you push, it's simple as that. Refactor a test, new API class, bam, it's there on the next pull. Front end updates, let's get them soak testing right away. Even if it's not all done, we're deploying and we're watching changes hit production bit by bit. That's the only way to be sure our stuff is rock solid. Code conflicts? I've been tackling them for decades, no sweat. But for code to go to production, you need pull requests, a solid PR process to guarantee quality. 
More importantly, how do you write code with everything interfering with everything? Picture branches like a highway with many parallel lanes. Trucks and tourists, like big features, take their lane and bug fixes or updates take the fast overtaking lane. Different teams or features or cards are like cars in different lanes, all working towards the same destination, but not interfering with each other. Uh -uh. Like renting a new car or jumping on a motorbike in the fast lane? This lets you experiment with cool new stuff. Anytime a branch isn't vibing, you can just ditch it, no fuss, and no harm to the main branch. For our app, we'll likely have a very clear flow from Kanban card to branch to pull request to develop branch to production deploy. Simple and no messy commit stance between different tasks. Chaos isn't ours. Chaos. Yeah, the web development is wild. <laughs> Forces pulling projects from all sides, product, architecture, legal, marketing. Agile is like a chaos hugger. We're not about building grand cathedrals here. No, sir. We're crafting bazaars that are reactive to consumer needs, self-organizing. They can grow and flourish quickly like nature. Agile is about the journey and we are never really going to reach the destination. So we need to embrace a smooth process for continual development and improvement of our software. TBD, trunk-based development, will help improve collaboration. As soon as something is committed, the whole team that will have the chance to access it. They can use it, extend it, refactor it, delete it. They can interact with it. This is only available to us if we push directly to the trunk. We'll also catch potential conflicts and interdependencies early on and not at the end of a feature. This faster feedback leads to an overall enhanced code quality and issues and bugs are identified and resolved sooner, reducing the risk of technical debt accumulating over time. The collective ownership of the trunk code base promotes a shared responsibility for code quality. You're all about CI and quality, right, Michael? Code quality? Absolutely. But shared responsibility? Nah, doesn't fly. Feature branching? Super useful for new stuff or tweaks. Each branch is like a private room. Your changes don't mess with others. Safe spot to play around and try new things. Very 2023 to have a safe spot. Branches mean easy sharing, reviews, and teamwork. More teamwork means higher code quality, standards met, and catching issues early. Also, not all changes are features. What if we have a bug and we need a hotfix to push out? We don't want to accidentally push an untested feature we're safe in, in the knowledge that we can push out our production branch with such a hot fix. Untested features. Branches might be leading you to skip the good stuff here. You know, testing and feature toggles, I, I honestly thought a bit higher of you, Michael. Maybe that's why Failure Driven sent me to Copenhagen and left you back home in Melbourne. <laughs> Trunk-based development leads to less work in progress, which in turn means faster time to market, accelerating the delivery of new features, bug fixes, and enhancements. It allows teams to release software more frequently, respond faster to customer needs, and quickly iterate. Maintenance and troubleshooting is much easier because changes are made in smaller increments and integrated regularly. It's simpler to track down the source of any new issues since code changes simplify the debugging process. Did I say that right? You get the point, it's better. <clears throat> and finally, trunk-based development aligns better with continuous delivery practices, which emphasize that the frequent and automated deployment of software. By maintaining a releasable state in trunk, teams can more easily achieve continuous integration, automated testing, and just efficient deployment pipelines. But what if things go haywire on the main branch? Or what if you've got half-baked features that shouldn't go out with other stuff? Sure, feature flips could work, but there's room for slip-ups, slip right? That's where feature branches shine. Changes stay cosy in their own safe space. Not to mention that branches and PRs is how open source works. It's the basics, the basis of semantic versioning and as a good way of dealing with bugs separately from any features being develop, developed. Also, branches are the only option in deployed software like hardware, TVs, cars, phones, where there is a gated process to release the code anyway. And it often relies on the user to do the actual install. 
of a valid release and not some half-assed, in-progress, trunk-based mumbo-jumbo. Branches for the win! Oh, we kind of went a bit deep on that topic. Trunk or branches, have you all voted? This is, this is the last round. This is the last chance for Blue to win. I know that you are trunk-based developers. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes? One or two, one or two. Developers, can, developers, you... developers, developers. <laughs> <laughs> if you voted branches, you can unvote and change to trunk. Okay. <laughs> All right, grand reveal. This is the last one. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> There we go. There is a scorecard there. Um, oh no, I needed, to, I needed to refresh this. There we go. 2023 Copenhagen developers. Michael, how did you get that tally at the end? Do you know what? I'm just going to override uh, and I think blue one. Woo! <laughs> Huge, huge thank you to the audience for your participation, helping us break all those ties, although I do question some of you now. Also, a big thank you to Mike, you, Michael, who unfortunately couldn't make the trip to be here in real life, but he's been an amazing pair presenter all the way from across the world in Melbourne, Australia. What time is it there? Uh, it's almost 11 p.m. I'm here in an empty workspace. The lights have gone out. The alarm hasn't gone off. Uh, I left the dogs and kids and my wife back home and the city of Melbourne is about to party because it's Friday night! Woo! So there you go, 11pm from across the globe. Certainly past my bedtime, that is commitment. Again, we have been sister, brother duo, Selena and Michael. Follow us at Failure Driven. You can see what we're getting up to next. There is another QR code there for you to scan if you like. No votes this time. Thanks. You've been a great audience. And I'm just going to do a quick selfie. Um, this is the one time that I get to be the biggest person in the photo. You've been amazing. Thank you.